How are you guys? Uh, we have a lot of space up in the front. So I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to put you guys on the spot and just kind of get you guys to move up as close to the front as we can. I'm talking to you, Jay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just so if there are any other peeps that come a bit later, they can sit in the back as well. But maybe you try and spread out as well so we're not all here. Um, I hope you guys are well. We are about to head into a time of worship. Um, yeah, so I'm going to invite you guys to stand up. Um, hopefully you guys have had a good week. It's been a nice sunny week. Um, and now we're all here together. And yeah.
Happy Sunday. Welcome to OC. If you're new here, welcome. And if you come here all the time, welcome again. It's so good to have you. If we could just get all the lights on, please. And you may take a seat as I, whoa, voice nearly cracked there. Whoa. That's why I drank some water. Uh, <laughs> okay, so just a few quick announcements. But before that, if you're new here, and I know that there's definitely one person kind of new, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's, who, you two want to quickly raise your hand just uh, so we can give you a warm welcome. Hello, do you mind just quickly just telling us your name? Selfie, selfie, yes. And then we go, I think one more, maybe, not? He's new? He's not new. Okay, well, he's new to me. Do you mind just like, just introducing yourself? The William Ting is in the house. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a warm welcome. So just quick two announcements before we uh, can mingle with these uh, new friends of ours. Uh, number one is the coffee machine is broken. And I know that we said that last week and a few people were upset. Maybe this week we can give them a bit of a reason why it's, uh, why it's upset, why it's broken. <laughs> I don't know who would know, Hiskia, Hiskia, where is he? Yeah, at the back. Why is it, do you know why? I heard you were doing some fixes. Is that why it broke? I actually can't even hear him. I don't know why I'm even trying this. I think it's something to do with it leaking. I don't know. But anyway, I think it'll be shut down for maybe the next week. Yep. Yeah, so maybe you can go to Mac Cafe, support local business, you know what I mean? Uh, second announcement is, uh, <laughs> he really loved that joke. I like this guy, William Ting. William Ting, everybody. <laughs> Um, second announcement is there is parking on this side. So as you go to OC, uh, there's still some cars there. So I don't know if that's your car or if it belongs actually to the, uh, the business next door, but uh, we've been kindly asked not to park there. So if you do park there, please don't park there. There are rumors going around that people are flattening the tires and they're very specific with it. They only flatten three tires. I don't know why, but apparently if you flatten three tires, you can't get insurance about it. So I, don't, I, I can ask Ethan about that. He, uh, He's an expert in that area. I don't, I don't know what that's about. Um, but anyway, enough of my awkwardness. Uh, let's put a minute on the clock and we'll have a minute to mingle. All right, if you just make your way back to your seats, we got three more announcements to get through before I hand you over to the lovely Maddie and team and co. All right, yes, I see you running, I see you running. Okay, uh, first announcement, uh, we have a TNT party, woo! Uh, so unfortunately, if you're over the age of 17, you're not eligible to uh, attend. However, if you are over the age of 17 and you are a parent, you are eligible. Bring your kids, bring your uh, kids to this welcoming party. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, okay, because you just, okay. Okay, good, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of effort that's being poured into this, specifically by our, uh, I can announce this, because it's because it, I, I confirm, but Evan and Hesky are, are, are kind of taking new roles in uh, TNT, so maybe we can just welcome them. Yep. So they put in a lot of effort into this uh, party. So if you uh, know anyone who would like to attend, please share this with them. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll publish the uh, slides somewhere so you can get all the information right there. Uh, so there's going to be food, uh, a new way to make new friends, and there'll be a lot of fun music, games, that kind of vibe. It's going to be great. 
and that's January 27th, 7 p.m. Oikos Church. Yeah, not O'Connor. Yep. Uh, okay, next slide. Combined midweek. Uh, so next Wednesday, we have midweek here. So this is going to be the first one of the year. I highly, highly recommend you go to the first one of the year at least because that is where we'll have everybody combined in this church. We'll worship together. We'll sing together. We'll do life together, cry together, all that stuff. It's going to be great. Uh, and, and specifically, that's going to be a bit more conversational. So we'll just do a bit of a check-in on each other. How's our New Year's resolution going? So please come to that one. It'll be great to see everyone again back at midweek. All right. Uh, lost and found. Uh, there's, a, yeah, there's a box outside with items that are unclaimed. They will be donated uh, on the 1st of Jan. They will be donated on the 1st of April. That's the next deadline. So please rummage through there. Take a look if you've left anything behind. All right. And last one, uh, giving. So uh, I just want to encourage you, if you've never really considered about it, uh, please consider it this year, uh, especially now um, as we go into worship. Just, just quietly ask the Lord, how can, I, how can I honor you more with my finances? How can I honor you more with my wealth? Uh, and I believe the Lord will speak very clearly because it's going to be something you'll struggle with. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, details there and I'll just hand it back to the worship team. Why don't we stand to our feet?
We give thanks, Father, for your presence, for your spirit that lives within inside of us, Lord. We thank you that he is so close, that you are so close to us right now, Father, that your spirit is poured out over our lives, God, and you are not so far, you are very close, and that we have a God that understands and cares, and a God that is dependable, because what Jesus did on that cross, because he paid the price, now we can draw closer to the Father. And His Spirit is poured out to His people. Thank you, Father, for your beautiful plan, your redemptive work done in the Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. May your Spirit be poured out over this church, over our lives. May it change us, transform us, make us whole, make us new, Father. We ask this in your mighty name. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, worship team. You guys can grab a seat. On your way down, make sure you uh, compliment the person next to you. Say, I, I love the way that you smile. I love the way you look. You look amazing. Don't be fake about it. Don't be fake about it. Be real. But also don't, don't be real if it's not true. 
Well, uh, if you're new here, welcome to Oikos Church. My name is Gershom, and um, no, it's not the same person that did the emceeing. Uh, that's my brother, Azer. A lot of people mix us up uh, because we have glasses now and same hairstyle and black shirt, I guess. But yes, we are two different people. So welcome, welcome if you're new. Um, we're going through the book of Haggai, actually. And I realized that actually not a lot of people knew that uh, that was even a book in the Bible. So um, I'm excited to go through this together as we go on to the next part of chapter one. It's only two two chapters, really. And um, if, you've, if you want to start your Bible reading this year and you haven't really got it started, I recommend going through the book of Haggai, just two chapters. Um, it's really, really good, and it's very short read. You can read it in like less than 10 minutes, um, depending how fast you read. And what we really talked about last week, if you weren't here, was really about resetting priorities. You know, what is your number one priority? Is, is, it, is it work? Is it, is it this or that? But God is actually calling His people back in the book of Haggai in the Old Testament to come back to Him. Hey, you've, you've been busy doing your own thing. You've, you've, you've started building your own houses when I've asked you to build this temple. How come you've, like, is it time to really do your own thing? Why don't you consider your ways? Because what was happening was that these guys were starting to do their own thing, build their own houses, invest their own things. And then they start to feel very unsatisfied. And then God actually says this. He says, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. So God is trying to prompt them and say, hey, all that stuff that you're doing, living for yourself, how, how satisfying is that really? Because at the end of the day, I hear you're complaining. I hear that you're not really finding life itself satisfying. How about you redo your ways, reset your priorities, and come back to me and find life itself? So that's, that's usually the pattern of God. You know, throughout the whole Bible, God would convict and rebuke His people. His people would consider their ways, would reflect, and then they would turn back to Him. And sometimes He would do extreme measures to make sure that you can reflect in this in the book uh, that we saw last week, we saw that God was actually making them not uh, satisfied with their life, that they were finding the, 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 the random things that they do in everyday life quite unfulfilling. So then God actually revealed to them, hey, consider your ways. And that's applicable to us because sometimes we might be doing our own thing, realizing, oh, I need to work a little bit more, or maybe I need to do this, or maybe I need to get that, but not realizing that's not actually going to be the solution itself. God is actually the one that's trying to draw, uh, prompt you to draw yourselves back to Him. And that's where they are. And why I like the book of Haggai is because it's quite an interesting book. Because when God actually says, hey, turn back to me, the people actually did turn back to Him. And we get to see what that looks like. So I'm going to read off where we left, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. So if you have, if you have your Bibles with you, um, go to Haggai chapter 1, verse um, 12 to 15, and then chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. The reason why I said that very slowly is because last week, apparently, I said, if you had your Bibles with me, turn to the book of this. And uh, yeah, people laughed at me, and I didn't realize why. So here we go. Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. The people obey the Lord. So finally, we get to see some good news. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheetal, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. And the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheathel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 20th, fourth day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Now we go into chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. The coming glory of the temple. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not, for, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth 
and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Father, we thank you so much for your word this evening. We pray that it would speak revelation and truth to us as we open it, as we read it, as we understand it. Lord, may your truth be revealed this evening. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen. All we get to see is the pattern of how God usually calls his people. He, he usually has a word, a rebuke, some sort of conviction. And from that conviction, there's some sort of reflection where we start to turn and look towards God. And the interesting thing is when you understand that, maybe you can actually identify and hear what God is actually doing in your life. Because sometimes he may call you in situations where you think, oh, nothing's going right in my life. Like, am I really prioritizing the right things? That's actually God might be prompting something within you. Hey, something's not right here. Start to turn to the right things. So what we get to see is this pattern. And as we go through, this is how it looks like. So let's just go to the next verse. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, God enters into the people's lives. He says, the word of the Lord came, and it says, consider your ways. Perhaps that might be you right now. Consider your ways. It's entering into your life. Hey, just, just have a moment to, to think. Is, is what you're really doing the main thing that you should be doing? And in chapter 12, uh, verse 1, chapter, uh, verse 3, verse 12, it says, The people obeyed the voice of the Lord, and the people feared the Lord. So they reflected, and they started to see, oh, actually, I need to obey. Actually, I fear the one who actually entered into my life. And we see in the next slide, in verse 13 and 14, God says, I am with you, declares the Lord. He reassures of his presence. The Lord stirred up the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And in verse 14, they came and worked. So we see this pattern that God does when he calls his people that there's a conviction, there's a rebuke, and there's a moment where we ponder and think and then we turn to him and then he starts to shake up. He starts to stir within your spirit and he reminds you and reassures you that he is with you. And then you can continue to do what you actually need to be doing in your life, in your season. That's the, the pattern of, of God. And, it, and it's really important to us because ultimately what God is really trying to do is, hey, make me the priority and you will see how everything comes together. So when we start to see this pattern, what stage are we potentially at? Do we hear the conviction? Are we ignoring it? Is he calling us to reflect? Is he calling us to obedience? Because ultimately, we are there somewhere. And I'd like to sum up the first chapter into this one illustration. If I could just go on the next slide. Imagine an empty jar. This is a famous illustration used between a Sunday school teacher and their students. The Sunday school teacher goes, imagine this empty jar. And I start filling it up with rocks that are the size of my fist. So the rocks get put in until the very top. And then the Sunday teacher goes, hey, students, is the jar now filled? The students will say, yes, it is filled now. But then the Sunday school teacher grabs a, a bucket of gravel and starts pouring it between the cracks. And then it goes up to the top. And then the teacher asks, is the jar now filled? And the students go, yes. But the Sunday school teacher now grabs fine sand and pours it into the jar. And it goes into the even smaller cracks. And then the, he asks again, is the jar now filled? The students go, uh, no. And then he grabs a jug of water, starts pouring it, and the water gets to the very top. And he starts to ask this question, so what is the point of this illustration? One of the kids goes, it means that uh, no matter how packed your schedule is, there's always room for more if you try even harder. The teacher goes, no, 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 that, that's not it. The point of this illustration is that if you had put the big rocks in last, it wouldn't have fit. Does that make sense? If you had put the sand in and the gravel in and the water in first, the big rocks don't fit. The question is, what is the big rock that you put in first? So chapter one, God is actually trying to say, make me your priority. Make sure that is the first thing that is in that empty jar. And then everything else will come all in place and together. But if you, if you try to, I'm, I'm going to do a bit of work first, and maybe I'll prioritize this family first, or maybe my love life, a little bit this, a little bit that, maybe my investments, my studies, whatever it is. And then maybe if I have a little bit of time, I'll put those big rocks in, which is God. Those are the main thing that holds everything together. Don't. Fit. That's, that's not how God works. God is calling for him to be number one 
priority, then all things will be held together. So that's pretty much the summary of chapter one, guys. If you didn't see it last week, do watch it, but um, that's essentially how we go through it. But now, now it begs the question, now that we obey God, we hear his word, what's next? Like, is that it? It's not just a one-time obedience, right? Sometimes there's challenges. And what we actually see is the book of Haggai. These people were excited. They were, they were thrilled. Yes, I'm going to obey you, God. I want to give you my life. I'm ready to build your temple. But then shortly after, they were very, very discouraged. And isn't that quite true to some of us? You know, you start a new diet at the start of the year. Everyone's like, oh, man, I'm going to lose a lot of weight. I'm going to go to the gym this many times a week. But then shortly after the you know, 3rd of January, you're already like, oh, you know, I don't think I can really do it. It's hard. The excitement's kind of worn off. Sometimes it's like that as well when we're called to obey, when God has given you a clear vision, hey, come follow me. The initial excitement is great. It's amazing. But what we see is that what requires is persevering obedience, not just the one-time obedience. And we get to see this. So in chapter 2, verse 1, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the, by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And we can date this to October 17th, 520 BC, which is close to the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So basically, the people were celebrating. They had a lot of reasons to celebrate. But at the same time, they were discouraged, so the celebrations were kind of cut short. And the reason why they weren't really celebrating, because in verse 3, God actually asked this question, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not, not, not as nothing in your eyes? The issue was that God had called these people to rebuild the temple. But there were some people in that group a bunch of 70-year-olds who had seen the temple that was built 66 years beforehand and how amazing Solomon's temple was. It was amazing. It was lined with gold. It was really big. It was glorious. It was beautiful. It was, it was so much worth in it. And then they saw what they were building now, and they were like, ugh, that was nothing like in the old days. Like back in my day, that was way better. This is nothing. So everyone was starting to get really discouraged. That was the issue that the people... In, in the book of Haggai were facing at the time, that they were called to obedience, but when they started to obey, the thing they built wasn't as good as they thought. It, it, can we relate to that? Like, you know, God calls us to, to start this ministry, you know, like for me, when I, when I first learned drums, I was like, oh, it's going to be amazing, right? Learning drums for the first time is going to be good, but it was just so hard. The rhythm, the beat, it was so hard. I couldn't never play on time. I just felt so discouraged, and I was like, this isn't my thing. But some, when God calls you to obedience, it's not the actual obedience that's the hard part. It's the persevering obedience is actually what he's really calling you. And sometimes we cut it short because we think that it's done. It's not good. It's not good enough. You know, you start a new diet, you, a new gym routine, a, a small group, a new ministry, whatever it may be. It's not as glorious as you thought it would be. It's not as glamorous as you think it would be. Ah, oh, then it's not really good. But that's not what God is trying to say. And we see this in the book of Haggai. And what we really need, guys, is persevering obedience. Not just the one-time obedience where you're on your knees, God, yes, take my life, I'll give you all. We need persevering obedience. But the enemies of persevering obedience is pessimism, comparison, and faulty expectations. Potentially, God has given you something so real, something so clear for you to follow and do, whether it's raising your kids well, whether it's doing this or doing that. But persevering obedience, the enemies of those are pessimism, comparison, and faulty expectations. We look at pessimism as the first. They can come from multiple forms. For example, loss of excitement. It had been a month since the people of God, like, yes, I obey you, God. Yes, you're stirring my spirit. I'm ready to do your work. And then a month in, they were discouraged. Oh, it's not as good as I thought it would be. The initial excitement wore off. And the thing is, what we learn from this is obedience is not sustained by emotions. You, you can't do the things that God calls you to do by pure emotions. It may get you started, but it won't make you last the whole run. You can't persevere with just emotions. But so many of us are deceived and think that, oh, because I'm so excited right now, I'm so thrilled right now, I'm, I'm going to be able to go all the way. Now, nah, emotions only last a very short time. What we actually need is his faithfulness and his presence. And that's amazing because in verse 13, God says, I am with you. He starts off by saying, people of God, I am 
with you. Before they even start to do any work, I am with you. And then they began starting the work. Yes, they were excited. Yes, they were thrilled. But God reminds them, hey, it's not your emotions that's going to make you go through and make you obedient. It's my presence and my faithfulness. And he continues to remind them as we go through this book. And he continues to say that to this very day to you and I. I am with you. It is not your emotions that sustains you to be obedient. And we see that they were also pessimistic because of the delays. You know, they had built the foundation and it had been 15 years before they did anything else. And then they started to see, oh my gosh, it's just rock. Come on, like, where's, where's the rest of the temple? Where's the rest of the thing? They started to, to wonder where, where, where? In a, in a time where we want things instantly. Oh, I, I want to be able to do this and get that. We want it to be done tomorrow or yesterday. We aren't in control of God's plan and timing. All we are called to do is be obedient. We cannot fast track his plans nor delay them. We can only be obedient to them. So that, that kind of removes the way that we can be pessimistic because of what delays may come. If God has called you to be faithful to a small group, to a family, to, to a relationship, whatever it is, don't try to rush it and be pessimistic because of the delays. And we see that something else that contributed to their pessimism was criticism. If we go to Ezra chapter 1 to 6, we start to see that these people were threatened by their local people. Do not build this temple. They threaten them. Don't do this. Don't do this. But the truth is when God calls you to do his kingdom work, there will be opposition. There will be criticism. Not everyone along the way is going to go, oh, that's amazing. That's good. Keep going. Keep going. There will be people to encourage you. But expect some people to be critics. That's what the people of God were faced with. But that's why the reassurance of his presence is so important. Without it, you're going you're gonna to die going trying to obey. Because your emotions can't sustain you. Because you think that it's too, too, too long. It needs to be done faster. And when someone criticizes you, you're going to be hurt. And then you stop. But we need his presence. So we see the first enemy of perseverance, obedient perseverance, is pessimism. But the second killer of that is comparison. Comparison is a big one. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 11 to 13, it talks about the whole, whole view of the historical account of what's happening in Haggai in the big picture. And we see that some people were very encouraged when the temple was starting to be built and some were very discouraged and you see the encouraged ones were actually the young folk that had never seen anything to compare it to but then the older folk were like oh man this is nothing like it was back back in my day and they were very discouraged see how discouraged they are and I'll read it Ezra chapter 3 verse 11 to 13 so they just laid down the foundation and they sang responsively praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid this sounds like a really positive thing they're praising they're celebrating it's great and in verse 12 but many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's house old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid though many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Can you just imagine that this foundation was built, and the young folks like, yeah, come on, amazing, so good. And the, the old folks are on their knees weeping, oh, God, it's so bad, I can't believe how bad it is. And, and it describes their account as like they both shouting, weeping at the same time to the point that people far away could not understand like what actually is going on. I've never heard someone shout so much with joy and weep at the same time of the same thing. Can you see that comparison is suddenly the thief of joy here? The, the young folks had nothing to compare to. They were like, God asked me to start building. So I started to build a foundation and I saw it and it was amazing. It was good. Thank God. Praise him. Joyful shouts. The older folk saw the temple foundation be built, they could immediately compare it and they could not even see what God was actually asking for. God didn't ask for success or, or for a glorious or beautiful temple. He asked for them to be obedient and that's it. But so, so much they thought that 
it had to be perfect, it had to be good. It was nothing like what we saw before. And comparison just killed their joy. When I was about 10 years old, I really got into basketball and I went to my friend's house and I saw an amazing basketball ring and I was like, man, if I could get that basketball ring in my backyard, man, I'll be the most happiest kid in my, in, in, in my whole suburb. And then I, I kept talking about it. Mom, mom, man, I saw this, my, my friend Peter, he's got this awesome basketball ring and I, I just really want it. I really want one. I really want one. And, you know, she's like, oh, God, I got the hint. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. So my birthday came around, and, she's, and she was so happy. She was like, oh, I know exactly what you want. And, you know, you'll never guess it. <laughs> what did I get? And then <laughs> in the back, a massive box. And I'm like, oh, no way. Oh, what could this be? <laughs> Open it up. Surely enough, it's a basketball ring. But uh, I quickly noticed it's, it's a little bit smaller than I, than I, than I, than I remembered in Peter's house. It was this plastic um, ring, probably about this high. <laughs> Hoop is probably like this. The ball is probably like, you know, this size. <laughs> my face is dropping. I was like, oh. I, I kid you not, I ran into my room, like, close to weeping. Just like, oh, my mom hates me. She doesn't know what I want. Like, oh, my gosh, why would she get me something so half-baked? Like, ah. Uh. I, I seriously, man, I, I don't know how to feel because I knew my mom was so excited, was so happy for me, but I was just this ungrateful kid, like, crying in my room, like, man, my mom hates me. She got me this, what is this? Like, I was just so upset. And it's, it's just so clear because I had this expectation. I had this thing to compare it to. And then sudden, suddenly that just killed the joy that whatever my mom had in store for me. I mean, we refunded it after that and it was all good, but <laughs> I never played basketball after that. We've got to realize, church, that if God's called you to something, be careful not to compare it to someone else, something else, what has happened before. Be, be, be careful with this. Like, seriously remember this because God might call you to be faithful to, to raising beautiful kids and then your neighbor's kids are so much better or whatever, taller or more obedient or whatever it is, and then you go, oh my gosh, I'm doing such a terrible job, man. Or, or maybe God's calling you to be faithful to a ministry, to a job, to a relationship, and you start comparing, but that, that, that person has way more fun. There's way more fruits over there. That, that, it looks so much more glorious and beautiful. Be careful. Seriously, be careful with that comparison is the thief of joy that's the common saying but here we get to see that it actually is neglecting the main thing that god is calling you for obedience he's not calling you to build something amazing and successful he's calling you to obedience and we see that the last killer enemy of persevering obedience is faulty expectation a wrong view of success can seriously discourage us. See, what the people saw on the outside immediately, suddenly warranted failure, discouragement, and weeping. Seriously, it said weeping. That that's how much, like, they didn't reach the expectations that they were weeping. I mean, I kind of understand what that feels like now, but they were weeping. We must know, church, that God does not judge on the outside beauty. We must not do that. Frequently, we see God not interested in outwardly, outwardly appearances. And I could go through so many examples of how God uses the lowly, the meek, the humble, the ones that aren't beautiful or glorious or in appearance. But I just have to look and show you one example. And that example is Jesus. In Isaiah 53 verse 3, it describes the coming Savior to be this. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. If, if, if God chose to use Jesus who wasn't particularly special in appearance, that people would despise at his message and would reject him and would regard him so lowly, how dare we ever think that just because it does not look beautiful and great, that, that does mean that God didn't call you. Be, be very careful of this. So many people might think that this is what success looks like. So if you're obedient, then you're going to achieve this. God does not look at the outwardly appearances. So just because it doesn't look like this, it does not mean it's a failure. You're called to 
Obedience, not success. That's what God's people are here for. Obedient, not success. So it, it, it means, you know, if, if he's called you to be, just do what you're meant to do. If someone's devotions are longer than yours, then let those be longer than yours. It doesn't matter. You're called to be obedient to your own devotions. If someone's Bible reading is 12 verses longer than yours, then let it be 12 verses longer than yours. Don't, don't go, oh man, that person's much more holy than me because they do this and do that. Well, I, I better start reading more as well. It's just called you to be obedient with what you have right now. Not to compare and start looking at everyone else. Oh, that ministry is so much bigger. When I, when I was leading youth, I was so discouraged because... I was so close friends with, with people that had youths that were in the two, three hundred, five hundred people. And my youth was like 50 people or less. And we did amazing great things in our youth. I look back and I'm so grateful for the youth. But at the time, all I could just see was like, man, we're, we're about like, they're not even halfway there to what God has called us for. That was such a big mistake on my part. We're called to obedience, not success. So definitely not worldly success, guys. Yeah. But we, we can be reassured that everything that we commit to the Lord is not done in vain. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord of that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Obedience, not success, church. Obedience, not success. It's for his glory, not our own. And we find that that is the most truly satisfying way to live, for his glory, not ours. But we are encouraged in the face of discouragement. These, these people were faced with discouragement, but they were encouraged by God because he gives his, his reassurance. We see in verse 3, he actually understands and cares what is going on, right? He, he, he asks the question in verse 3, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not nothing in your eyes? He actually addresses the issue. He, he noticed there's encouragement discouragement. He noticed that the people are sad, upset, so he addresses it. He asks it. He understands. He, showing, he shows that he cares. He didn't just go, oh, keep carrying on, guys. Keep going. Keep going. He says, you know, who, who else is actually among you that actually saw, like, addressing the situation here? But yet he's, he turns the point very quickly, and, and pay attention to this part. Verse 4, yet now be strong. He acknowledges why they're discouraged, what has happened, but he quickly says, yet now. Not, 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 oh, if only you could have, or maybe you should have done this, or what about if you tried doing a little bit of that? He says, yet and now. How many of us are too focused on what could have happened, what could have been, what could have been done, should have, could have? Yet now be strong. He shows that he understands. He shows care to the situation why you're discouraged. But he quickly turns it to yet now be strong Zerubbabel. Be strong Joshua. Be strong all the people. Be strong in attitude and in action. Be strong. He calls them to obedience. He calls them into the present moment. Not dwelling on the past, not on what was, could have been, but now. Verse 13, remember he starts off by saying, for I am with you before they even started the work. That is very important. We are reassured that his presence is there. In chapter 2, verse 5, in the midst of discouragement, what does he remind them again? That he is with them as well, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, my spirit remains within your midst. And today we have a greater assurance because this is now present through the Holy Spirit living within every believer. It's not up there, but verse 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Today we are assured in our obedience that God is with us. That's important. Emotions aren't going to sustain us, but his presence will, his faithfulness will. I'm going to end by saying this. There's a very freeing way that you and I can actually live on this earth for the rest of our life. Not constrained to what we don't have, but actually living for God. And it goes like this. The most freeing way to live is actually just to be faithful, obedient stewards of God for what he's given you. If he's given you a lot, be faithful stewards to that. If he's given you a little, be faithful stewards to that. Whatever season you're in, whatever people you know, whatever relationship, family that you're in, 
just be faithful stewards to that. It's not going to look the same as every single person. But if we understand that he is ultimately in control, all we can do is just be faithful stewards. That's all we can do. We read at the very end, the last few verses, chapter uh, 2, verse 6 to 9, it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, and notice how many times I'm saying the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and sea and dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. What does the Lord of hosts actually mean? It means the, the ruler of the universe. It means that he is in control of every single thing. That, that all we can ever do is just be faithful, obedient stewards to God who is actually in control of everything. Whatever he's given you, whatever time, whatever limitations, whatever freedoms he's given you, you all you can do is just be faithful to it. And tell, I'll tell you what, that actually frees you from so much burden, thinking that you have to do every single, single thing. You have to bring all things together. It's him that holds everything together. You put him number one. And all you have to do is just be faithful stewards to what is in your life right now. That is so freeing to live. Because you might ask the question, oh, should, I, should I have been doing that? Or should, should, I, should I really have been there? But if God was always your number one, your priority, you're meant to be where you're meant to be. He's given what you have and what you need. Just steward it well. But it's too busy sometimes thinking, what's next? What's next? What's next? But what's actually in front of us right now? What we've got to be faithful with right now? Is it a difficult situation? Is it a, a joyous occasion? Be faithful. Stewards, obedient, right now. And we see in verse 6 to 9, basically, there's a prophecy that's being, being shared here. And, and a lot of people kind of have discussions what this prophecy is all about, whether it's about the near term, because King Darius eventually tells them, hey, here's all the resources. Everyone build this temple. Don't, don't do anything else but build this temple. And there's other prophecies that say that it's about Jesus' second coming, uh, about the future date, but one thing is definitely certain is that it th speaks about Jesus entering into the world that we have already experienced. Verse 9, it says, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and it, in, in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. It's not on the side again, but verse John chapter 14, verse 27 says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That's what Jesus says. We have ultimate peace in Jesus. And ultimately this whole rebuilding temple stuff is just so that God can reside with his people. He's building the temple so that God could dwell amongst his people. And you and I have the Holy Spirit. He is here with us. So it's not about... Could I, could I do things a little bit quicker? Do I need to do a little bit of that? Oh, man, someone's criticizing me. Am I really doing the wrong thing? If, if God's called you, he's stirred your spirit, he reassures you of his presence, that's all you need to keep going. And if you're discouraged, what you're reminded of are his promises that he is continually with you. I'm going to bring the band up as we come to a close. And I'm going to share this very last story. It's about a, a man named David Livingston. Anyone know him? David Livingston? Um, no, he's not a rock star, but he was born in uh, 1813. Died in 1873 at the young age of 60. David Livingston, he was one of the most famous Christian missionaries our world has ever known. One article describes him as Mother Teresa, Neil Armstrong, and Abraham Lincoln rolled into one. He studied theology and medicine, so he was a doctor as well. And he received his medical degree from the University of Glasgow at 1838. Um, Livingston was first and foremost a missionary, sharing Christ to the many unreached groups of Africa. He was an explorer and a main key person in, 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 in the abolition of the African slave trade. So there was a horrific slave trade that was going on at that time, which he exposed to the Western world. His findings were world-changing. Not only did he bring the gospel to the lost, but he revealed the, to the, con uh, the continent of Africa to the world. Livingston explored and mapped out the uncharted continent. He also exposed the horrific 
treacherous slave trade happening in Africa. These findings had never been known by the Western world prior to Livingston. Imagine that, all these horrific things that no one actually knew in the Western world. He is considered the greatest abolitionist for Africa's former slave trade. He contributed to destroying, to actually making sure that that slave trade was gone. Another last thing is from coast to coast. You know, it wasn't easy as he was doing his missions. Livingston and his men faced trials. The missionary experienced severe illnesses, many kinds such as malaria and terrible fevers. He often starved and had very little clean water. There were hostile tribal groups along his path in which only the Lord could save him. Livingston and his party were even attacked by the Dutch because these men wanted the slave trade to grow and hated what he was doing and exposing them. He did amazing, great things. And I just wanna, I wanna share some quotes that he shared. He says, these three amazing ones. I'd rather be in the heart of Africa in the will of God than on the throne of England out of the will of God. He continues and says, God, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me. Only sustain me and sever any tie in my heart except the tie that binds my heart to yours. And he also says, there is one safe and happy place and that is in the will of God to just be a faithful, obedient steward. The last thing they actually shares that I want to end with is this. He was interviewed and asked, you know, how, how did you do all that? that? That was crazy. Like you, you went to Africa, no one had ever been there before. And how did you do all of these things? He says this, shall I tell you what supported me through all those years of exile among a people whose language I could not understand and whose attitude toward me was always uncertain and often hostile? It was this, and he quotes Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. David Livingston understood that God was with him in everything that he did for his kingdom. And he, he didn't doubt it. He wasn't worried. Yes, there were severe illnesses. Yes, there were trials. But he was reassured every step of the way that God's presence was with him. I, I, imagine what kind of people we would be if God calls us to obedience, but we stayed persevering in obedience, shooting down any sort of pessimism, any comparison or any faulty expectations, imagine how resilient the people of God would be, how you and I would be. If He's called you to be faithful to this, then you would stay faithful to it, not comparing what does it look like if this happened or that happened, how come that person's a little bit better? Imagine what that would look like. How much would be achieved in His kingdom where we wasn't even relied on our ability to achieve the successes, but actually His presence. That we would step into unknown places that God has called us and we would go, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know what it looks like. I don't even know where to begin, but I am reassured that His presence is there, so I'm going to go forward. Imagine the places that He would take us and the places that you would go. So in the face of encouragement, church, God does encourage us and He reassures of His presence. I am with you always until the end of the world. I am with you always. And perhaps that might be what you need right now. If God's called you to some great thing, you're going to have opposition. You're going to feel like sometimes eh, this might not be the right thing. That's normal. But when you turn back to God, what does he reassure you? Be strong, be strong, be strong in attitude, in action. I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Nothing is too late or too quick in my timing. You are just called for obedience, not success. That's the most freeing way to live, church. Obedience, not success. I'm just going to let the band lead us into worship and maybe for a time for us to actually have some moments with God as well. to be 
Señor aquí. Come, come to a close now. I'm just going to pray before we do. And I, I acknowledge that there's many seasons and many people here right now are going through different parts of life. And I'm certainly sure that there will be times where you will be discouraged, especially when God has called you to do something faithfully and obediently. But what I want to pray right now is a reminder of God's presence with you and even His encouragement and reassurance as well. So Father God, we thank you so much that right now, Lord, that you have called us that you have helped us to consider our ways and as we have reflected and as we come back to you, Lord, help us to stir within our spirit, Lord, so that we can continue to persevere in obedience, Lord, but more than that, be reminded of your presence with us, Lord, that you are with us, declares the Lord of hosts, that you are in our midst, that your spirit is living within inside of us, guiding us, correcting us, showing us what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, Lord. We thank you, Father, that your presence is not far away, somewhere out there, Lord, but very close, closer than we know. So thank you, Father, for that. May we be reassured of that, Lord. And may we actually go to your word to be reassured of the unchanging truth that is found in it, that your presence is with us, Lord. Not my words, Lord. Not any songs we sing, Lord, but your words through scripture alone. Thank you, Father. We praise you. We give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen. That's it for today, church. Next week, uh, we finish up, oh, we almost finish up chapter two, and we start to talk a little bit more of what, uh, what that obedience kind of looks like in, uh, in everyday life as well. All right. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. Thank you. God bless.